Hi, I'm Barbara Wheeler, and I'm a Longwood Fellow from Dunedin, New Zealand. It's through my career in botanic and public gardens that I've been truly lucky to have met some incredible and unusual plants. As we confine ourselves today to our bubbles, it provides us a great chance to look into some different worlds. And today I want to take you into my world and introduce you to some truly incredible plants and tell you their story. So buckle in and join me on a journey into my plant world of my top 10 amazing freakish plants. We're going to start our journey today with the monkey hand tree. It's sometimes known as the devil's hand tree, so even the name seems quite sinister, doesn't it? As those flowers age, they'll actually drop to the ground and your tree ends up with a carpet of hands beneath. It really looks almost ghoulish when you're walking underneath the tree. These trees grow in the cloud forests of Guatemala and Mexico, so it is quite tender unless you're in zone 9 and above. You will need a large glass house to grow it in. It is an evergreen tree. It reaches mm, around 40 to 50 feet in height, so it is going to be quite large. These flowers occur in spring and summer, and these are the, the interesting part of the tree and what I want to focus on. The flowers don't have any petals at all. They don't look like the flowers as we would normally see. And I'm going to focus on the centre photo. And you can see where I've marked the hand that projects up from the cup down here. And on this hand are the fingers and the yellow colouring to the fingers is actually the pollen. That's the male part of the flower. And then if we look closely at the photo that I'm arrowing now, you can see a sort of appendage projecting up with a yellow tip. That's the female part of the flower. That's the style. And that style will actually, as it ages, droop down between those pollen fingers so that when the pollen is ready, the style will have already drooped down and that'll be ready uh, for when the birds come along. Now, the birds generally are perching birds or bats and they will come into the cup and drink this beautiful nectar that the plant produces. As they're drinking the nectar of course they're brushing against those fingers. They will get covered in pollen on their heads and as their heads are covered in pollen they will brush against that style that droops between the fingers and be transferring pollen from the fingers onto the thumb. It's a really clever, clever way of pollinating, of the plant pollinating, and it's it's just an incredible plant. And you can also see the leaf, which is just beautiful, this big leathery type of leaf with a underneath that coppery sort of venation to it. Beautiful tree and well worth having a look. If you can find one in a botanic garden or a public park, it really is worth seeing in, in real time. Next up, we're going to the hillsides of the Himalayas with rhododendrons festooned over the hills and then underneath the rhododendrons in that beautiful woodland environment, we'll see the whipcord cobra lily. This is a real giant of a plant. It reaches about four feet, which in this genus is one of the giants. The cobra lily is fascinating in its look, as you can see, but it also is fascinating in its structure because they have the ability to change sex. And that is such, such a rarity in the plant world because for most plants, sex is determined genetically. With the cobra lily, some plants are male, some are female, some will actually be both male and female, and some change back and forth. Generally, plants of the cobra lily tend to be male when they're young. They change to female when they're old enough to start pollination. And then, once they've finished fruiting, they can revert back to male. So when the plants are mature, 
they can actually have both male and female plant, flowers on the same plant. It's a really fascinating structure and it's one that saves on energy because you can imagine flowering and fruiting takes a lot of energy. So if you can just be a female flower in that one time and male on either side, you're going to save and reserve energy for that fantastic process of flowering and fruiting. It's a beautiful plant to grow and really easy to grow if you have a, a woodland environment to grow it in. On to the Katsura tree, a beautiful, beautiful tree with a, an incredible scent. It's almost too good to be true. It has a really, really sweet scent that is released by the yellowing fall foliage, or it can be released when the plant is under drought stress in summer. And this smell is much like cotton candy and it hangs in the air, particularly on still mornings or around dusk. It's interesting and freakish, I guess in a way, nicely freakish, because when you crush the leaves, you don't smell it. It's purely emitted from the leaves, from the pores of the leaves, and it really hangs in the air. It's the most beautiful sweet scent, which is caused by a molecule called maltol, and it's released as those leaves senesce and fall off in fall time. The chemical is actually the same molecule that's released when sugar is burnt to become caramel. So that's why you'll often hear the katsura tree being called the caramel tree. I love plants because often there are mysteries surrounding them and the katsura tree has the biggest mystery, which is it's not known why that scent occurs. It's not known whether there's any evolutionary purpose behind the production of the scent. So it's nice to have, a, have something that's not known yet to science. The flowers themselves don't have any scent and the female flowers on this plant are very demure compared to male flowers and that's often the case in the plant world. The image that you can see shows the female flowers and it also shows these beautiful young heart-shaped leaves. It's a beautiful plant, well worth growing if you have a large garden. It is a large tree, so it needs a lot of room. But next time you're in a garden and in fall time, if you smell cotton candy, have a look around and see if you can see this tree with its heart-shaped leaves. They'll be yellowing at that time. And you'll be sure to have found your cotton candy scent. I'm going to introduce you to stinkwood, a New Zealand plant which I really love because the scent takes me back right to the New Zealand forest where this plant grows. The name tells us everything that we need to know. The English name New Zealand stinkwood tells us exactly what the plant is going to do. But when we also break down the botanical name, it gives us more hints. Caprosma means smell of dung and foetidisma means extremely vile smelling. So really, we know exactly what we're going to get when we see this plant. It's the, the scent is emitted from the, the leaf itself, but unlike the katsura tree, this one you can crush the leaf and you'll get an intense kick of that scent. It's an unusual smell. Uh, I would liken it to somewhere between rotten eggs and rotten cabbages. And, and it, it's there to, to help protect the plant against predators. So there is a, a really useful trick that plants have in their repertoire to protect them from predators and from predation. As is often the case in the plant world, the male flowers, which are these ones here, are far more showier than the female flowers, which are these ones here. And many plants exhibit this trait. The New Zealand stinkwood, such a beautiful plant. It's, 
it's a shrub as opposed to a tree but a beautiful shrub nonetheless and one that you would need probably zone nine and above to be growing it outside I'd be hesitant to grow it in a glass house just because of the scent that's emitted from the leaves but you know why not have a crack with it and it's always a talking point when you bring your, your friends around on to a green rose this really is such a fascinating rose it's certainly not the one you would expect to see and not one I don't think you'd be selecting to give to your mother on Mother's Day unless your mother is really keen on unusual looking roses the green rose is actually really polarizing in that people will either love it or they will hate it and there's often quite passionate debate on both those sides there is no in between you will either love it or hate it it's been in cultivation actually for quite some time since 1743 so so many many years and it's believed to be the result of a chance natural mutation it really is fascinating it's it's certainly a rose that does get attacked by aphids it's it's prevalent to aphids so if you're someone that that wants to grow resistant varieties that that don't get attacked too much by pests and diseases maybe the green rose isn't for you um, but if you can cope with it it really is another of those talking points to add to your garden here's a plant that many would consider is the rock star of the plant world and it often needs no introduction because wherever you hear it hear of it flowering it will bring crowds and crowds of people hundreds of thousands of people in some cases this is the titan lily or the often it's called the corpse flower and again it's a name that tells us the entire story but let's let's look at it a little bit more because it's it is one of the largest flowering structures in the plant kingdom and it also has one of the foulest scents in the plant kingdom this huge flowering structure rises up to about 10 feet above the ground the one that we have in the image here is actually quite small this one was growing at Dunedin Botanic Garden in New Zealand in, a, in 2018, in the summer of 2018. And it was quite small in comparison to many of them that you see growing around the world. And in the other photo, we can see here the leaf. And for many years, when you first get your Titan Lily, it starts to leaf up in spring. It continues to go from dormancy to leaf to dormancy to leaf each year because with this plant it needs to build up the reserves that it needs to produce such a gigantic flower the first flowering is usually after mm, anything from seven to ten years generally speaking and when the flower is fully expanded and it's ready to pollinate the spadix which is inside the flower heats up heats up to an incredible temperature and then it emits this nauseating smell much like a dead animal I'd suggest I've I've certainly smelt it in in, in real life and it, it's it's not very pleasant and it stays in your nasal passages for quite some days after you've seen the plant the scent is at its height in the evening and the flowers only open for such such a very short time only open for 48 hours before the flower begins to close up again and then the whole flower structure starts to collapse after about three days once the flowering is finished of course the plant will go into dormancy again because it needs to rest it needs to to bolster its energy to to do flowering once again in the future so it'll go through its normal cycle of leaf and dormancy, leaf and dormancy, until those reserves are built up to flower a second time and a third time and so on. 
Plants can flower again after that first flowering in as few as 18 months or as many as five years. It's very dependent on the plant. Each plant is very unique. Such a fascinating plant. If you get the opportunity to view it anywhere around the world, definitely take it, even if you have to line up for an hour or two hours to be able to get in to see it. It's such a treat to see the Titan lily. Another plant that has a bit of a, a scent to it is the starfish iris. It is in the iris family, but it's not an iris. It's got a very succulent look and feel to the leaf, but it's the flower that we're going to focus on. It's a native to South Africa, so you do need a frost-free location uh, or have some form of protection for it from frosts if you're trying to grow it outside. Alternatively, you can try growing it in a container so you can bring it indoors over winter, but you really do have to make sure that you move it outdoors in spring before the flowering commences because the flowers are pollinated by flies and if anything's pollinated by a fly, it, it's bound to emit an, a, not a pleasant scent, normally rotting meat or, or rotten something. And, and as this one does, the starfish iris has, has quite a scent to it. I stuck my nose in this one. It's, it's a funny thing, isn't it, about flowers, that when you see a flower for the first time, you put your nose into it because you want to smell it. It seems natural. Um, this one you don't want to put your nose into. It's, it's a very, very strong scent of rotten meat. Insects are actually duped into thinking that the flower is a suitable place to lay their eggs. So they land on the flower and they'll walk all over the flower trying and failing to find a place to lay their eggs. They leave dusted liberally with this bright orange pollen that you can see in the middle of the flower. What the starfish iris does provide the, the insects is a concentrated nectar so they can sip on the nectar as they flit around the plant and they're, po and they're just covered with the pollen and then they flit to the next flower and, and transfer the pollen. Each flower just lasts a single day so, so it's very short lived in, in its flowering but it has quite a number of flowers over it so it's, it's really special. I think it is. it does look freakish but it's really pretty with that maroon colouring and also that, that fringed look to each of the petals. It's a very small perennial plant, gets to about one and a half feet tall. Brazilian Dutchman's Pipe, another fascinating plant, beautifully coloured, such a large flower, but it's not the looks that are bizarre because that, that flower is, is just very beautiful. But it, it's how pollination occurs. And this is a very, very intricate story of pollination. This plant is actually a woody climber. It's from Central and South America. So it, it's, it's a tropical plant and it needs a conservatory glass house to grow in. You'll often see it in public gardens and in botanic gardens around the world. It's such a common and popular climber to, to have in your glass house. But our story starts with the flower producing an odour much like rotting meat. And as we've, we've already discovered, rotting meat smells with plants mean flies are the main pollinator. So with this Aristolochia, flies are attracted to that smell. They find their way into the flower and down the throat. And this is where things get really interesting because the throat has downward facing hairs so it actually prohibits the, the fly being able to climb out. And then the throat of the flower constricts, so the fly is trapped within it. Handily though, the plant produces nectar, so the fly actually has something to feed on while it's incarcerated in the flower. Once the plant's actually ready to do its release of pollen, it opens up an exit route so it allows the fly to leave. 
because there's no point in it capturing a, a, a pollinator because the pollinator can't get out to actually pass on the pollen. So it needs to allow it needs to allow an escape route. So in doing so, the fly brushes past those pollen grains and gets covered with them. As it flies out, it visits another flower and it brushes pollen onto that next flower and that, that quite intricate process of pollination is completed. Plants are incredible with these stories and I, I, I love this one. I actually saw this plant growing outside recently, in fact, at Chanticleer Garden in Wayne in Pennsylvania. It's growing outside against a restroom wall at the entrance. So maybe if you have a frost-free location, you can try to get it to survive in the local climate. If you can't, it'll be well worth going to Chanticleer and, and seeing this plant actually in person. But as I said, you go to most botanic and public gardens with a conservatory and you will see this plant growing. A giant lobelia. So unlike any of the common lobelias that we see as annual bedding plants or accents in the perennial border, we often see the little lobelia, I think it's called Crystal Palace. It's a little annual bedding plant that you'll see along edges of borders. Uh, this one, same genus, but vastly different species. This one's endemic to Mount Kenya in the East African mountains. So very, very much an alpine environment plant. It produces multiple rosettes. And if I show you the rosette, the rosette is this here. This sort of leaf area, and it forms this rosette. And, and each plant will form mm, anywhere up to 18 to 20 of these rosettes. And each rosette will grow for several years. And it, as it reaches maturity, it produces a single large inflorescence. And that inflorescence is this one here. It's, it's very unique in its look. And you can see the flowers just nestled in, in there, just nestled beautifully in amongst the 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 bracts of the of the flower and you can see it on the close-up image to to uh, to the other side so each rosette grows for several years before reaching maturity and producing that single large inflorescence which then sets lots and lots of seeds and then that that rosette will actually die but because the plant plant has produced up to 18 or 20 of the rosettes there's enough that will continue on and they will survive and flower in future years. This uh, plant is interesting also in its adaptation to, to, I guess, stay and survive in that alpine environment because water collects in those rosettes of the leaves in the moist environments where it usually grows. And that's, that water is important for its survival because during the cold weather, when, when water, that water freezes, it actually protects the growing tip from being damaged. So it's often called the gin and tonic plant because of those crescent-shaped ice cubes that form in those rosettes. Beautiful plant, so well worth growing and such an unusual uh, lobelia, so different from any others that I've seen. I wanted to finish with this one because it's one of the most unusual and bizarre plants of the world and the story of the octopus of the desert is just incredible. I met this plant very recently, in fact, when I was in Chicago at the Garfield Conservatory. I just happened upon it. I wasn't expecting there to be a Wellwitchia there. It's a plant I've heard a lot of over my career. Uh, I had never seen it in real life. So I was just blown away to see this one. 
you can see it, it's scrambling everywhere and it's hard to know where, where the actual centre of it is. But when we look closely, we can see the centre right in here. The interesting thing about this plant is that there are only two leaves, two permanent leaves. That's all. It has a stem, two leaves and roots. It's a very straightforward, uh, I guess, basic plant. Uh, not too much complication about it. Those two leaves continue to grow throughout the plant's lifetime. They lie a little bit like ribbon along the ground and they'll become quite tattered and torn as they age. Fantastic plant that lives anywhere from 400 to 1500 years. Really is incredible and that they're found in a small area of the Namib, Namib Desert in Southern Africa. Uh, if you can't get to Southern Africa, go to the Garfield Conservatory in Chicago and you will be able to see this plant and hopefully be as ecstatic as what I was when I first saw this amazingly freakish plant. Well, thanks for joining me today and allowing me to introduce you to my top 10 of incredible, unusual and inspiring plants. But now it's your turn. Once public gardens, botanic gardens and national parks are open once again, take the opportunity to go and visit your local one. Have a good look around and start to make your own list of your top 10 unusual, weird or freakish plants and share the photos with people and really get others inspired into your top 10. Look into the stories and just be excited by what the floral kingdom has to offer. Enjoy. Thank you.